Greetings and welcome to today's webinar, Understanding Conflict Across Cultural Differences with Phyllis Braxton. My name is Marissa Smith and I'm the Director of Student and Recent Alumni Engagement here at the Alumni Association and I'm absolutely thrilled that you all have chosen to join us um, for today's important topic. Before we get to uh, the presentation today, I have a couple of housekeeping announcements. The first is to thank our University of Minnesota Alumni Association members. Our members power everything that we do, including the alumni webinar series. So if you're joining the webinar today as a member, thank you for supporting our work. And if you're interested in learning more about membership, you can do so online at umnalumni.org. February is Career Month, our second annual Career Month. And what that means is we've planned a ton of webinars and events all designed to help you advance in your career. So whether you're at the early stages of your career, you're at your mid-career, or even thinking and planning for an encore career, we hope that you'll consider joining us for another webinar or two yet this month, or one of the many networking events that's happening both in the Twin Cities and around the world. You can see many of those listed out here on the slide, and you can learn more on our website at umnalumni.org slash career month. And I wanna thank our sponsor for Career Month, Freedom Financial, for helping us make this important initiative possible. Another upcoming Career Month event is an in-person workshop with today's presenter, Phyllis Braxton. So if you enjoy the content today and you wanna go deeper into it, I would encourage you to come join us on February 25th in the afternoon at McNamara Alumni Center, where we'll go deeper into the content and really get hands-on um, experience working with the topic, intercultural conflict styles. If you're new to using the Zoom webinar technology, a couple of things to share. First, you've most likely joined using your computer's audio system, which is great. But if you want, you can also listen over the phone by dialing the number displayed on the screen and when, enter, uh, when prompted, enter the webinar ID. This information should have also appeared in the confirmation email you received leading up to today's webinar. Next, questions are welcome and you can submit them at any time using the Q&A button that you see uh, pasted there. All right, without further ado, I want to introduce today's presenter, Phyllis Braxton, and turn things over to her. So Phyllis is the CEO and founder of Pink Consulting, which she started back in 2006. And Phyllis has been in the diversity, equity, and inclusion field for nearly 20 years. Phyllis is a native of Moss Point, Mississippi, but currently resides in Minneapolis, Minnesota. She has strong ties to the University of Minnesota as she was an adjunct professor teaching graduate level courses in diversity and received her master's degree at the University of Minnesota. She has also led numerous trainings on these topics um, at universities around the country. She recently graduated from St. Catharines University and St. Thomas's Masters of Clinical Social Work program and is now a licensed graduate social worker. I want to thank Phyllis for joining us today and know that this is going to be an engaging presentation. Let's pull that up and turn things over to Phyllis. We're going to jump in with uh, an activity uh, here. And so I'm going to have you read this statement that's on the screen. And I'd like for you to count the number of times you see the letter F. Count the number of times you see the letter F. And just hold that number to yourself. Okay, so here comes the question. I'd like to know, and we have a poll here, I'm gonna ask you to just select how many Fs you counted. So if you counted five or less Fs, you can click on that. If you counted six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 or more. So we got numbers coming in there. So the main point here, are my viewers, are they able to see? The polls, or shall I share it with them? Okay. Most people have responded. So now you can see the results, and you're probably saying to yourselves, okay, we were all looking at the same screen, we all heard the same instructions, 
Why is there a disparity amongst the answers? Well, I've done this activity around the world with probably a third of a million of folks. And what just happened with this poll tends to happen in most rooms that I'm in, is that I show this statement and I tend to get a variety of answers. This is analogous to what happens to us when we're in conflict. We can be in conflict with a person, we think we're hearing and experiencing the same thing, but in that conflict, we're actually experiencing it differently. And so our time together today is gonna to be about breaking down some of those behaviors and what happens in conflict. Now, I know that there's probably some folks that are gonna have a really hard time moving forward, not knowing the answer or what's the right answer. I'm gonna share that answer on the 25th in the workshop. So that's gonna be a little bit of a cliffhanger. So we're gonna keep moving on. That was just our start. And so what we're going to uh, talk about today, I've broken it down. We're gonna be talking, we're gonna name conflict and we're gonna be using uh, a framework by Michelle LeBaron to talk about different dimensions of conflict because all conflict is not created equal. We're gonna frame conflict and we're gonna be using a framework by Dr. Mitch Hammer to talk about four equally valid conflict styles. You ever wonder why you're in conflict with someone? You think you have resolved that conflict, but maybe it keeps popping back up. Maybe you haven't resolved the conflict in the way that the other person needs it to be resolved. And so we're gonna talk about how might you be missing the message and how might sometimes emotions might um, have us misperceive what the actual conflict is about. And then the actual taming of the conflict, we'll talk a little bit about that, but we'll mainly get into taming at the workshop on the 25th. So, how do we think about behavior? Our behavior can really be associated in three buckets. Biology, those things that we're born with that can possibly be changed with medication and or surgery. Our personality, which is a combination of hard wiring and nature. And then culture, the things that's taught to us by our primary caretakers as the right way to do things. Another way of thinking about culture is, it's just the way we do things around here. And then that's all bundled into this thing that we call society. And so we're operating at any given point of time, if you see that star in the middle, our behavior can't be explained by just one of these things. So it can get really a little mushy uh, in there. I have an example that I often talk about, about being from the South, that I grew up in a predominantly black community where we often have negative lag time and how we communicate with each other. If you've never heard of negative lag time, it goes a little bit something like this. I'm gonna start talking before you stop talking. So I might overlay my communication with yours. Now, where I come from, that does not mean I'm being rude disrespectful, that I do not want to hear your opinion. Where I come from, that means you got me. I'm passionate, I'm in there, I'm on board with what you're saying, but I was being misperceived, misinterpreted when I moved here to Minnesota. And so I was sharing that in a workshop and there was a man in the workshop who said, Phyllis, I don't think that's cultural. I think that's biology because you're a woman. <gasps> Well, maybe he has a point. Do you see that uh, connection between biology and culture? And then we do have research that proves that women tends to get their speech back a whole lot faster than men do after having a stroke. So what can we attribute that to? We don't have all of that information. So at any given point of time, our biology, our personality, our culture can all be interacting together that explains our behavior. But for this workshop, we're going to be focusing in the cultural realm. And those things can be explained by what was taught to us by our primary caretakers. And given that that's the realm that's 100% taught, that's the realm where we have the most opportunity for change. If we were able to learn something, that means we have the opportunity to unlearn and relearn. 
So what is culture? Let's get some definitions and shared meaning. Culture is about patterns of shared basic assumptions and beliefs. It helps us approach challenges. It's learned or taught to all members implicitly or explicitly as the correct way to perceive, think, and feel. So I want you to think about something that you've been taught by your primary caretakers growing up. What you're seeing on the screen now is a slide that I use to talk about culture, and it's an iceberg. When you think about an iceberg, about how much of an iceberg can you see? Most people say, oh, Phil is about 10% or a very small uh, percent. I was doing a workshop in Montreal, uh, Canada with a couple of uh, school leaders and I asked that question and the audience said, oh, about 10%. And then there was one guy in the back. He said, oh, no, it's more than that now because of global warming. Well, I said, I'll have to check in with Al Gore about that. I'm not up on my stats. But what we do know is you can see more of the iceberg underneath the fault line, and we can only see a small portion above the water. That's analogous to what we can see about a person's culture or what we can accurately assume about a person just from looking at them. Most of what we know about a person we can't make that assumption about them just by looking at them. Only about 10 to 15 percent of how a person presents around their culture is out of our awareness. So we really do need to take time to build relationships to get to know those things about a person. Otherwise, we're going to end up having preconceived notions, stereotype, and bias around them. So if you see highlighted in hot pink there, eye behavior is one of those things underneath the iceberg. Take a quick second and think about it. What are some of the things that you were taught growing up around eye behavior? Some of the things I was taught was, look someone in the eye when they're talking to you. That's a sign of respect. And then on the other hand, I was taught something very contrary to that, which is Phyllis, when you're being reprimanded by your elders, you are not to look them in the eyes because then you're being defiant or you're showing a disrespect to them. So you're to look humbly and away and not make eye contact. Regardless of what you were taught, we were probably all taught something different. However, when we're interacting with each other, we often tend to assume that we were taught the same types of norms because we tend to hold each other accountable for what we were taught growing up around that particular behavior. And that is what gets us into cross-cultural conflict. So let's get some more shared meaning on some other definitions that are oftentimes just thrown out there, but people often have a different bubble that will pop up in their head when the word is used. The word diversity, and I'd like for you to maybe kind of chime in on this. I'd really like to just kind of see uh, what are some of the things that comes up for you when you hear the word Diversity. What are some of the things that you think about or some of the definitions or characteristics that uh, come to mind when you hear the word diversity? Is it food? Is it values? Is it um, traditions? What are some of those things? And then what about the word inclusion? Does that mean the same thing to you? Or does the word inclusion mean something different? I'm going to give you two really cool definitions that can help you distinguish between the two. Diversity simply is when we count people. How many people are here in our organization? Well, let's measure that with a demographic analysis. We have these many women here, these many men here, these many people that identify as uh, non-conforming uh, to a particular gender. Or we have these many black people here, these many um, Asian American people here, these many indigenous people here. We're usually looking to count a particular number or demographic of people to see who are we serving or who might not be getting services. So it has a purpose. Inclusion is where the people count. So diversity, we count people. Inclusion, 
is where the people count. Sometimes we tend to think that inclusion is a byproduct of diversity, but they both take very separate initiatives. Inclusion, how do we measure that? We usually measure that with um, measuring through employee satisfaction type surveys, how engaged are our employees? How welcome do people feel? If you think about diversity as welcoming people to the table to eat, inclusion is, did we ask them what type of food do they eat? And did we give them utensils to eat with? And if they don't eat with utensils, are we okay with that? So that's the difference between diversity and inclusion. When you hear me say diversity throughout this presentation, I am not using diversity as a code word for something more specific. For example, some people will use a code word for diversity by saying, oh, that area is really culturally diverse. Sometimes people might use a compound word, culturally diverse. I am not using that as a code word. When I say that area is racially diverse. If I mean race, I'll say that. If I mean socioeconomic status, I'll say that. But if I just say diversity, I really do just mean the fact of human difference that may make a difference. That would be my definition of diversity. The fact of human difference that may make a difference. So you might be asking yourself, Phyllis, what's missing in the middle? How do we get from diversity to inclusion? The thing that's missing in the middle is intercultural competence. Now that we have recruited this diversity, we're often missing, how do we make that mix work? People are often missing intercultural competency training. One of the biggest misnomers about this is that we tend to think that because we're well-educated, we're well-traveled, and that we're professionals, that we should just be able to be respectful to each other. Well, respect is one of the most culturally bound words in the English language. If you were to go to a dinner party tonight and go around the table to ask your friends, what would it mean for someone to respect you? You would get as many different answers as there are people at the table. And so just by trying to respect someone, you might actually be minimizing what it is that they would need. And so intercultural competence is about knowing yourself first and then looking out to find out what that other person might need for you to accomplish the goal. Intercultural competence really is about goal-directed behavior. And when you have that, you can have all of those things working in concert with each other. So we get to our definition of intercultural competence. It's about two things, cultural self-understanding and cultural other understanding. If I were not aware of my own interruptive communication style, moving to Minnesota, I would make some assumptions and some judgments of the culture of how people communicate here. I would make judgments that people here are bored and boring because I had to learn to wait, let people finish their sentences, count one, two, three in my head, and then respond. So I've had to learn how to adapt to the cultural communication norm of the area without making a judgment. That's intercultural competence. So now I have my way of communicating and I've learned an additional way of communicating without judging it. To be able to say there are ways of communicating and they're different. One is not better than the other. However, now I have more tools to choose from. When I'm communicating with other people that have that interruptive communication pattern, I can switch and that feels more comfortable to me. I can do it that way. But when I'm communicating with folks who may not have that pattern and I know might have negative assumptions about the way I communicate, I can shift and communicate in the other way. That would be an example of intercultural competence. This slide has pictures on it that are very important in why intercultural competence is critical to team performance. Let's start with the big hump in the middle that says multicultural, monocultural teams. This is what we've learned from the research. When we have teams 
that are monocultural or that are from similar backgrounds, you're going to get the status quo in your goals. We've often heard that when you have diverse teams or multicultural teams, you get a better result. What we learned is just having diverse or multicultural teams does not get us a better result, especially when leaders ignore and suppress those cultural differences. They actually become an obstacle to performance and those differences get minimized and people are recruited and aren't, they're recruited for diversity, but they're onboarded for assimilation. And so those differences are not uh, are not shown, and if I'm recruited, and, there's, and, and I've been told, Phyllis, we really want to hear more opinions about the Black community because we're really trying to make more connections and inroads and network with the Black community, but once I'm recruited and I'm onboarded and a new employee orientation, I get told things, now that you're here, just be like us. That's telling me my background and my culture will not be warranted or will not be a good idea to input those ideas into the organization. So in those team meetings, I'm going to minimize my difference and you will get what you've always gotten. Multicultural teams, on the other hand, when leaders acknowledge those differences, cultural differences becomes more of an asset. And so you will get more performance and you will get better outcomes when you have those multicultural teams. Yes, I can repeat what I said about the um, recruitment. So oftentimes what organizations tend to do, and these organizations have really, really good intentions. I want to be clear about this. They recruit for diversity because they want differences. They want different opinions. They want to uh, have information about different markets that they're trying to uh, infiltrate. But what often happens is once they recruit that diversity in new employee orientations and when they're onboarding, different messages are sent that's saying, be more like us. And this is the way that we do things around here. And so it gives the impression that you should assimilate and be more like the dominant culture of the organization. Hopefully, I think that should, that should get you where you need to go. So given that, that brings us to our point of questions. I have uh, spilled out a whole lot of information uh, to you. So I'm gonna take just a quick second and try to read through some of the questions um, that we have and try to give some answers to that. So one of the questions that's coming in is how should managers support and acknowledge different cultures? What does that look like? One of the, thank you for that question. One of the biggest challenges, I think, especially in the Midwest uh, here where I am, is this whole notion around colorblind, being colorblind and minimizing difference. Or feel as if I acknowledge difference, would that, um, am I singling people out? Here's the thing about people who are different. We already know that we are. We're just waiting to be acknowledged in a way or in a respectful way and not in a way that's tokenism where that difference is acknowledged and valued. And so if you have employees with culturally diverse backgrounds and your organizations have goals where you're trying to use that cultural diversity being very transparent to say, Phyllis, given that we have goals where we're trying to recruit more employees from the Black or African American community, and we know that you um, have shared with us many times that you identify strongly with this community, I really would like to get your input on some of the things that we've been doing well and on some of the places where we're having challenges. I know that I identify as, as black and most people who identify as people of color or who are out who identify as gay or lesbian or people who identify as non-Christian in different workplaces, 
they want that difference to be valued. And so being transparent and asking questions that directly has to do with organizational goals, I think would be a great first way of having conversations around differences. I do see a question around uh, issues of microaggressions, which is a conversation, I hate to give the lawyer answer around it depends, but it is a, a question a bit beyond the webinar, but I would love to address that question in person in the workshop on February 25th because it has so many um, outliers um, around it and I don't feel like I've given enough foundational context for it uh, at this particular uh, at this particular time. Uh, I'll do one more at this particular one more question at this particular time and then we'll keep going and then I'll I'll grab some more of your questions a little bit later. So another question is I've been in DNI trainings where we take a quiz to show how privileged we are. I felt that to be counterproductive. Do you have suggestions to help people see privilege and differences without minimizing anyone? Uh, sure. One of the uh, assessments that I use, and it is currently the only statistically valid and reliable assessment out there that measures a person's intercultural uh, competence is the IDI, and the IDI stands for Intercultural Development Inventory, and it doesn't just say either you're prejudiced or not, you're racist or not, you're sexist or not, you're homophobic or not. It cannot measure those things. I don't think any uh, assessment can. But what it does measure is what stage of development you are when it comes to interacting across cultural differences. What we know about how people learn about differences is that we learn about it is how we learn about other things in a developmental way. And if people have not been exposed to cultural differences in a developmentally appropriate way, they will get stuck um, in their own privilege or their unawareness of that privilege. And so oftentimes what I know from having been in this work for nearly 20 years is that People are getting in trainings, in diversity trainings in particular, that is well beyond what their development is ready for. An example of that is most often people are in diversity, um, equity, and inclusion trainings that are analogous to advanced calculus when they don't have the basic concept of algebra. So most folks are very gung-ho about going to anti-racism training, white privilege training, uh, implicit bias training, microaggression training, and even the new buzz, white fragility training. When we have research that shows us maybe only 15% of the population is developmentally ready for that kind of training. And so that's why oftentimes people are leaving those types of sessions feeling blamed and shamed around it. And so if you are interested in those types of trainings, one of the things that I would say is get with an IDI uh, trained professional who can give you an assessment, give you a one-on-one -on -one confidential feedback session that can help you understand where you are in your journey. And that will also give you an individual development plan for your stage of development that can help you understand what your journey needs to be. Um, I hate to get on my soapbox about this, but there's a whole lot of um, well-intentioned training uh, that's happening, people with best of intentions, but the impact is falling very short and in, in, and in many ways very harmful uh, to folks with really good intentions, but they're not aware of the current research out there that's going on that's holding diversity trainings to a new standard. And I think diversity practitioners, we all need to hold ourselves to a better standard at how we are um, treating participants uh, in trainings. And so that's what I say about that. And I hope that I can see those of you that are asking some of these more in-depth questions on the 25th. So with that, I'm going to keep moving, uh, moving on so that we can really now weave. I've laid some of the groundwork around definitions that you'll hear me talking about in the rest of the presentation. So 
different kinds of communication. There's crisis communication, which I really hope is a very small percentage of how we have to communicate. That's when all hell has broken loose. That's when we're throwing out the baby with the bathwater, no pump intended. That's when the police are coming in. That's when the doors are locked and we are uh, in corners. Those are uh, very hopefully rare types of situations that we're in. Then at the bottom, you'll see where hopefully we are the majority of the times when we are communicating. In stress-free communications, we don't have deadlines, it's not uh, conflicts, there's not misunderstandings, and it's stress-free communication. And then right there in the middle is conflict. There are some misperceptions, there is um, some mis understandings uh, that's going on between one or one or more parties. So that's where we're going to focus the rest of our time on conflict communication. We have some deadlines, we have some stress, we have some misinterpretations and miscommunications. So what we're going to focus on here is naming conflict. What is and what isn't conflict and what is that conflict really about? framing the conflict, and then what do we need to do to resolve the conflict? So naming conflict, let's get into that. What I'd like for you to do is think about a conflict that you've been in recently. And just a little joke, if you haven't been in a conflict recently, uh, there are some little initials behind my name. I am a, a therapist. I'll charge you one penny if you need to talk about that, if you haven't been in a conflict. So I need everyone to try and think of a conflict. Try and think of a conflict that you've been in. Make sure you're in the conflict because we tend to um, be a little bit better sometimes when we're not in the conflict, when we have to facilitate the conflict. I want you to be in it, in the conflict. What I'm going to do is I'm going to briefly explain to you three dimensions of conflict. And then at the end of explaining those three dimensions of conflict, I'm going to ask you what dimension does your conflict that I asked you to think about, what dimension does your conflict fall in? All right, here we go. Most conflict often starts with a material thing. And material conflict is more about the structures, the systems, laws, and policies. I'm going to use a very low-hanging fruit example of conflict to get us through this. My daughter, Ivy, she is 21 and she still lives at home. <laughs> yes, that was not in the plan, but she's still there. And so one of the laws of the land of, of my house is that Ivy is supposed to take out the trash. That's one of her chores. So that's one of the laws, one of the policies. When Ivy does what she's supposed to do, there is no conflict. If I come home and the trash is taken out, she has done the thing. She has done the law. She has dealt with the policy. There is no conflict. However, if I come home and the trash has not been taken out and I say, Ivy, will you please take out the trash? And Ivy jumps up and she skips to the kitchen with a smile. And she says, mother, nothing will give me greater joy than to take out the trash. The conflict is resolved. Material conflict. You get what you want, when you want it, how you want it. The conflict is over. Given that I'm still talking about this conflict, you must know the conflict did not end there. So now the conflict is in a different dimension. The conflict has now moved to a different realm. So now the conflict is in the symbolic realm because rarely does Ivy take out the trash without me having to either tell her or remind her to take out the trash. So now there's a pattern of behavior that is set up. 
And oftentimes when there's a pattern of behavior, we often assign meaning to that behavior. Okay, if that person keeps doing this, there's something behind it. And so we often will assign meaning and values. So if you had a 21 year old at home that's not taking out the trash and they know that that's their job, what might be some of the meaning that you might assign to that behavior? I'll tell you some of the meaning I have assigned to that behavior, that Ivy is lazy, that Ivy does not care about how hard I work for us to have a nice home, that Ivy is entitled, that Ivy is spoiled. She is an only child. Maybe some of that is my fault. I'll take that, right? So those are some of the meanings that I have uh, assigned to the, her behavior, symbolic conflict. And then there's relational conflict. This is how we communicate about that conflict and the interaction and how we depend on each other. And what is the relationship like? Do we have a previous relationship where we have the glue to be able to work through it? Or is there no relationship there where probably even more assumptions might be made as to the meaning of the conflict? So given that Ivy and I have a pretty tight relationship, we're in 21 years on this thing, right? We have a pretty tight relationship. I come in, the trash, it seems like the house just smells like trash. I say, Ivy, take out the trash. Now, this is important. Ivy gets up. She gives me the material thing. But how she gives me the material thing She's on her phone, on FaceTime, talking to one of her friends like I'm not even in the room. She stumps through the house, oh yeah, girl, she's home, like I'm not even there. Now, the conflict is just starting. It's nowhere near over, even though she's giving me the material thing. Now, we have relational conflict, because guess what? I'm the mom. I'm the big person, I'm the adult. You don't communicate or interact or talk with me that way in my house when I pay the mortgage. Now we have relational conflict. All right, so now you know what material conflict is, symbolic conflict, relational conflict. Given the conflict that I had you think about, I want to know now how many of you would say your conflict is only in the material dimension, only in the material dimension. So you have a poll there. How many of you would say the conflict that I asked you to think about is only in the material dimension. This is very good, very good. Thank you all for responding. So as you can see there, only about 7% of people said that their conflict was only in the material dimension. If you take nothing else away from our time together today, most conflict is not in the material dimension, but we often try to resolve it with a material thing. If you've ever wondered why you thought you resolved the conflict, but it keeps popping back up, and you're like, I thought we resolved that. I gave that person what it was that they wanted. You probably resolved the conflict in the dimension that you needed it to be resolved, but it's probably not resolved in the dimension that the other person needed it to be resolved. For example, with the trash, with Ivy, she believes that it starts over every day as a material conflict. Whereas for me, it accumulates 
every day as a different conflict that's symbolic and relational and it has an impact, a lasting impact on our relationship. Whereas for her, it's nothing. Mom, it's just the trash. What does it hurt for you to have to remind me and tell me that? Well, it means something. It means that you care or that you don't care about our relationship. It's actually symbolic to me about how much you care about me. It has absolutely nothing to do with how much you care about the trash. So that's my whole concept around conflict, about naming conflict. Probably stayed there too long. So hopefully this this helps you in conflict um, that you might currently that you might currently be in, really breaking it down and assessing which part of this conflict might be material, what part might be symbolic, what part might be relational, and thinking about what dimension it could possibly be in for the other person can be helpful in you thinking about how might I go about resolving the conflict. So you just got a little bit of practice with that and hopefully that's something you can take away with you today. In the workshop on the 25th, what we'll actually do is spend a little bit more time breaking down each one of those dimensions and I'll talk about what do you need to help you resolve conflict in the relational dimension? What do you need to resolve it in the symbolic dimension? We know what we need in the material dimension. We need the person to give it to us the way we want it, when we want it, and how we want it. So we'll talk about those other two more in depth. And I'll take a quick pause here um, to try to get at a couple of more um, questions. I, I see several questions about uh, the IDI. And for those, I will refer you to me. Uh, on those, you'll, you can shoot me an email about the intercultural development inventory. You can do that with me or some of my uh, other partners. Uh, I can definitely connect you um, with that. I see another question I'll try to answer. As a mixed race person, I have found that people often try to put me in one category of race or another. As a result, trying to find my place in the world has been challenging because I don't identify as just one race. I always say and acknowledge my mixed race. Have you found any avenues for mixed race cultures? Thank you for that question. This tends to be I will put this in the caveat of conflict. I think uh, this framework that we're gonna be using and this next piece that I'm getting ready to get into, uh, this framework by Dr. Mitch Hammer has become extremely validating for people from mixed race um, backgrounds and just even from any racial background to help them become more validated in how other people are perceiving them especially when they show up in conflict, because this particular framework around conflict does give us research-based information that different racial groups and ethnic groups tend to show up in conflict differently. And so what it can do is it can validate for some folks, oh, this is why people are perceiving me this way. And it can also validate uh, for us why we might be misperceived in our own culture uh, for other folks. I know for me, my conflict style is actually the conflict style that tends to be the style that most white people tend to have. And what I've learned in my own community is that when there, are com when there is conflict in a predominantly black community, I am t people tend to call me a sellout because I don't show up in conflict the way most black people tend to show up in conflict. And now I have some valid research that helps me better understand. It doesn't mean I lose my black card or that I'm not culturally black. It just means in conflict, I tend to have a different cultural uh, way of behaving around that. And what I know now is that I got that from my father. My father and my mother operates in conflict very differently. And I remember very early on in my life noticing how people treated them differently and me being very, very 
uh, astute in saying, wow, I want people to respond to me like they respond to my father. And so I remember trying to be more like my dad. And my mom's conflict style does mirror more of the conflict style that the research shows that more people that are U.S. born Black American tend to fall in that particular quadrant. And so I'm going to show you, uh, show you that quadrant uh, here towards the end uh, of the workshop. So I, I hope that's helpful. Uh, thank you for that. Thank you for that question. So as we come here as we're nearing the end, I want to jump into a uh, framing uh, conflict. So what you're seeing here on the slide is a sender receiver process, right? You ever hear the saying communication is a two way street? Well, hopefully this slide proves that wrong. <laughs> At the very least, communication is like a four way interstate. And that's like when you only have two people communicating. So if I send a message to you, what am I using to send that message? I'm, I'm using my own cultural background and things I've been taught to send that message to you. Now, you are the receiver of that message. You have to decode my message. What are you going to use to decode my message? you're going to have to use your own cultural backgrounds and interactions to decode my message. And that's how our cultural filters and frames can get misinterpreted. And we can mismanage each other's message. And so these are some of the things that we've learned about what happens when we try to communicate in conflict, is that in stress-free uh, situations that we're fairly adaptable. Oh, that deadline got pushed back? No problem, girl, we can push that meeting back. Not a problem at all. But in stress-free, I mean, when we're under stress, our adaptability is reduced. And so when that adaptability is reduced, we need different strategies that we can be consistent with in our primary environment. And so when we're under stress, that can lead to increased possibilities of misunderstanding and conflict. So two main things here. When we're, un when we're not under stress, we're fairly adaptable, adaptable. When we are under stress, our adaptability lessens. Those are the two main takeaways. So doing something like an intercultural conflict style inventory, it really helps us get at what is our core individual approach to resolving problems and conflict? Now, I know all of you are wicked smart, fairly adaptable, and professionals in your work and what it is that you do. But oftentimes, we don't really know what's at our core. So what this tool helps us do is really get at that core of when we're stressed out, where might we tend to go if there were no negative consequence? And so this is not about judging our style, about if it's right or wrong or good or bad. It's just about this is a good thing to know about how we're going to process information so we can be aware of how we're going to show up so we can start developing some tools and some skills to be most effective in those times of conflict. This uh, framework can be used on an individual level. It can be, I use this with individuals in coaching. I use it with teams when they're having conflict or not so that we can get a head start on it. It's best to use it sometimes when you don't have any conflict uh, with new teams so that you can understand that in those times, you won't have that uh, hurdle of mis perceiving each other in those times of conflict. I have done this particular assessment with an entire organization so that they can better understand how they might be minimizing people's natural abilities and tendencies when they are in conflict. So this is what we know. Misperceptions, communications, differences in goals, those things by themselves, they're not necessarily conflictual. They can be cleared up with some basic communication skills. 
if we had a difference in goals, oh, I thought the goal was that we wanted our alumni um, to be able to network with um, everyone that has graduated from the university, does not matter what year they graduated. I thought that was the goal. No, the goal is we want people to be able to network with people within a 10 year window. Oh, I didn't know that was the goal. Some basic communication cleared up that goal. Here's the thing. If there is conflict, Dr. Mitch Hammer would say, it's grounded in two primary characteristics. There's perceived incompatibilities. I can't accomplish my goal if you accomplish yours. And it's grounded in emotional upset. Now, this is the piece that gets me really excited. I don't know about you, but most other frameworks around conflict, what do they tell you to do with your emotions? A lot of them say, put them on the shelf or calm down or you need to hold the emotions in or minimize the emotions. With this particular framework, emotions have, have equal play. And it's saying, if we do not deal with the emotions, we will not be able to resolve the conflict. And I know that should be very refreshing to many communities of color. So in times of stress, emotional upset, disagreement, and conflict, people tend to revert to their primary cultural programming. I'll revert back to uh, an example that I gave you earlier. I talked about my interruptive communication pattern and that since moving to the Midwest, I've learned how to pause, nod, count, wait my turn. I've learned how to do that in stress-free communication. When I am under stress and in times of conflict, it is very, very difficult for me not to go back to my primary cultural programming. Now I've at least learned to say, I am very sorry when I get very passionate about things, it's very hard for me to wait. I would really appreciate it if you would let allow me to have a turn now. I need that. So in times of emotional stress and upset, people tend to revert to their primary cultural programming. I'm showing you this slide again because oftentimes in diversity training, people tend to focus on those things on top of that iceberg. In intercultural competency training, we wanna focus on those things underneath the iceberg. And so in the February 25th training, when we go through uh, focusing on handling uh, conflict, we're gonna be focusing on patterns of our relationships patterns of handling emotions, patterns of handling conflict, and patterns of communication. So we're gonna be dealing with those things in the whole framing of conflict. So primary characteristics in conflict, what's going on for people? Two things, how we verbally communicate the message, whether we do that directly or indirectly, and how we overtly express emotions, whether we do that emotionally expressive in an overt way, or whether we restrain our emotions. Now, it's not a judgment as to if you're direct or indirect. It's more about to what degree are you direct or indirect. So an example of directness might be, hi, Sarah, how you doing today? I noticed that I came behind you uh, after you finished making uh, some copies at the copier and there was a jam still left in the copier and it made me late for my meeting. I really would appreciate it in the future if you would clear your jams. <sighs> that can sound really intimidating to some folks. That's direct communication. You leave nothing unsaid, the person understands what you're in conflict about, it kind of sounds like bullet points, you are really going for the solution. Indirect communication can sound and feel very different. Hi, Sarah, how are you doing today? How was your drive in? 
Yeah, girl, this weather is something else. I'm getting there. For indirect communicators, right? If Sarah tells me that she had that she had problems getting her daughter dressed, she had a flat tire, there's no way I'm going to bring up a jam in the copier. Why? Because people who are indirect communicators tend to focus more on relationships and people who are direct communicators tend to focus more on the solution. More about direct and indirect communicators on the 25th. Now, I want to talk about emotionally expressive and emotionally restrained communication, which is different from direct and indirect. So when I first talked with Sarah about the copier, you might say, oh, that was pretty restrained, which it is. That's my natural conflict style, direct communication and restrained in my emotions. Now, what's important to know is that restrained folks are not emotionless. We do have emotions. Our preference is just to hold them in. But we have that churning and burning going on, just like an emotionally expressive person who might go to Sarah and say, Sarah, I came behind you earlier at the copier and there was a jam left in there. It made me late for my meeting. <sighs> I really would appreciate it in the future if you would clear your jam. Now, some of us might be saying, oh my goodness, are you kidding me? Would somebody really say that at work? Probably not in the Midwest, but they probably might want to say that, but they might hold it in. So that's the difference between emotional restraint and emotional expressiveness. We'll go deeper into that in the training. What's the main difference between restraint and expressiveness? is that for restrained people, they're trying to build trust with you, with you through your willingness to restrain your emotion. Expressive people are trying to build trust with you through your willingness to show your emotion. So that in and of itself causes more conflict. And so then the conflict is no longer about the copier, it's about our willingness to show each other our emotions or our willingness to restrain the emotions. And so given those four characteristics, whether you're direct or indirect, expressive or restrained, you fall in one of four categories of conflict styles. And those styles are these, engagement, discussion, accommodation, and dynamic style. With these styles, we will go more into uh, details on uh, the 25th. You'll get to understand more about what each of these styles, what their strengths are, what their perceived weaknesses are by other uh, styles, and we'll uh, watch some videos to give us some practice on how might we handle conflict with people in those different styles. Wow, wow, that went fast. And I'm embarrassed. I feel like my neck hurts from <laughs> nodding to so many things that you said. Um, thank you so much for sharing your time and expertise with us. I feel like there were a lot of really tangible takeaways that people can take back to their workplaces, can take back to even their family and friends, and use to hopefully help navigate those material, symbolic, and relational conflicts in the future. Um, so you heard a lot about the workshop on the 25th. We'll include more information in our follow-up email um, to you all, hopefully later today, along with a link to this recording in case you want to watch any parts of it again or share it with anybody who wasn't able to join us today. So I want to thank Phyllis again um, for joining us and uh, hope you all have a wonderful, wonderful afternoon. And with that, we will um, close out our webinar. Thank you.